Hello and welcome to Talking Books. I'm Jill de Villiers. Today we're talking about African wildlife conservation against the backdrop of rhino and elephant poaching. My guest is Australian author Tony Park, who has written 15 novels and five works of non-fiction. His novels are set in Africa. Welcome Tony and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on the programme, Jill. Tell me, how is it that an Australian writer is writing about Africa? You know, I didn't set out for it to, to be like that. All, I knew from the time I was a small boy, all I wanted to do was write novels and, and non-fiction. Uh, my wife and I uh, first travelled to South Africa, Zimbabwe and Botswana in 1995 on what was supposed to be a once-in-a-lifetime holiday. <laughs> like a lot of foreigners visiting this particularly amazing continent, we got hooked, whether it was the wildlife or the scenery or the landscape, I'm not exactly sure, probably all of those. And it coincided with me starting to write. And I found the inspiration for my novels in particular in Africa. And here I am, 15 books later, living half of my life in South Africa and half of my life in Australia, writing books set in Africa. Are you mainly writing about conservation? Yeah, uh, while they're, they're all novels, they're thrillers, and, and I, my wife and I have a particular love of the bush, and, and we have a house on the edge of the Kruger Park, so we've become very passionate about conservation. Unfortunately, there's no shortage of real-life material that makes for fictitious thrillers as well when you look at the world of conservation, because... Um, you know, it is in fact a war that's being fought at the moment to conserve species such as rhinos and elephants that you mentioned before as well. So the, the backdrop is real to these uh, fictitious stories about wildlife and conservation. Now that also stood out for me in the novel is uh, the, the war and you were a soldier yourself. Yeah, I served 34 years in the Australian Army Reserve, including um, some time in Afghanistan back in 2002. I think what we learned um, for the countries involved in the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq is that war these days is not just about guns and bullets and soldiers. You can be the, the, have the best army and the best foot soldiers in the world, but that is not enough to win a war these days. And I think if you look at the fight against poaching, uh, I believe the security forces and others involved in the fight to protect endangered wildlife in South Africa in particular are doing a particularly good job. The, the police, the military people, the South African National Parks people, the privately run anti-poaching units, I think they're, they're actually doing a good job, probably a better job than what most people know in foiling rhino poaching. Sure, there's a lot of rhinos still being killed and this is a very serious problem but the country is getting good at fighting the war. But this is a war that has to be fought in people's minds. Just as the war on terror is about convincing, uh, say, susceptible recruits that, that they shouldn't be going down this path, uh, I think if more needs to be done in the fight to conserve endangered species, it is in reducing demand in the user countries. When you look at things like rhino horn uh, and ivory, they tend to be Southeast Asia and China. Some work is being done by NGOs through targeted advertising and marketing and various tactics to try and reduce demand there. But my, my personal view is if, if more could be done, it should be done in, in that side of things, demand reduction. And it's something I've tried to touch on in the books mm -hmm. as well too. So there, there are many NGOs involved in trying to conserve species. Uh, and, and I think possibly if there's one thing lacking in, the, in this fight in this war. It's perhaps overall strategy and coordination where you allocate resources where they're most needed. Is there infighting between the NGOs? Yeah, I, I did quite a bit of research in this book because the backdrop to Captive is, is about NGOs. And, and one thing that came up time and time again when talking to people involved in NGOs, some of them good friends of mine, and I should say at the outset I believe that there's an awful lot of good work being done, an awful lot of goodwill being done in the NGO sector, is that uh, there's conflict there. And, and the conflict comes uh, partly for NGOs fighting for a shrinking pot, a, a shrinking uh, charity dollar. But I think probably a more concern is that there are many different approaches to conservation. And uh, these, these different approaches can polarise people and it can become quite acrimonious. Uh, uh, rhino conservation is a classic example where, where you, can, you can find NGOs falling into, say, a pro-trade group where, that believes that the trade in rhino horn should be legalised, and those are very much opposed to that. And I think when you have people setting up NGOs, uh, as one person said to me involved in a charity, he says it can become more about ego than actually the original noble aims. It's possibly human nature. It's because people will say, this is how I believe we should conserve the species it's my way or the highway. <laughs> and so you, you'll have these often diametrically opposed views to, to, for people who are all working towards the same end. And, and it does create a bit of conflict, mm -hmm. yeah. 
So what, in your opinion, is the right way to go about it? Yeah, as, as an outsider, as someone writing books, I've, I've stepped back and had a look at this. Uh, I'm actually working on another, to give you an example, I'm, I'm looking at another book at the moment, which will come out later in the year, and it's about dogs. It's about tracker dogs, sniffer dogs and attack dogs that are being employed in the war against rhino poaching in South Africa, to great effect. But when I've been researching that book, I've found out that there are um, South African National Parks dogs have, have dogs that are trained by the Honorary Rangers organisation. It's a fantastic organisation. There are privately run dog units in the private game reserves in South Africa. And there's an overseas NGO that's training dogs and handlers for use in the parks in KwaZulu-Natal. So there are all these different organisations, all training dogs and handlers, all with their own budgets and fundraising initiatives. There's no overall coordination. So my view as an outsider is there are many, many NGOs in this country and this continent all trying to do the right thing, but they're all kind of acting in isolation from each other. And I thought it'd be nice if there was some supremo or some overarching strategy that would say, here are all these groups, here's all this money being raised, but you know what, the need at this particular moment might be in one part of the country that isn't being serviced. So there seems to me to be a lack of coordination and strategy in this war. Mm. Now, um, in, in which country, you now talk mainly about South Africa, mm. but you're also on the Kruger Park, which borders Mozambique, and Mozambique features quite prominently in your novel, Captive. Um, how, how are things in Mozambique at the moment? Is yeah, it? Look, I think what I pick up is a, a certain sense of frustration, often from people uh, operating in, in, in across the border in South Africa. That you know, it's it's well known that a lot of the poachers, not all, but a lot of the poaching originates in Mozambique, and these poaching gangs come across the border into the Kruger Park in particular. Uh, will have a have a go at trying to get a rhino or two, and they'll melt back across the border. And of course. You know, there are constraints on, say, security forces in South Africa not being able to pursue these people across the border. So it becomes a political issue again. It's not unlike many modern day wars. And in Afghanistan, we would find that Al Qaeda and the Taliban could melt across the border into Pakistan, where they would be relatively safe. So it's a war that, again, kind of needs that overarching strategy where, you know, countries need to come together to make sure that enforcement is being done on both sides of the border. And perhaps, as I said before, that more resources are used to start tackling the problem of demand. Now, some people say to me when it comes to reducing demand, you will never stop people mm. from using things that they've used in traditional medicine and things like that. And I say that it is about education because when I was a little kid, I learned to play the piano on a piano that was made out of ivory. <laughs> and I don't think kids in the West these days would countenance having a piano that was made from a dead elephant. So the people's attitudes and approaches can change, might take a generation or two. And I think the big question is, does Africa's wildlife have that much time? You said there's a dwindling charity dollar towards this. Um, why do you think that is? Is it because have people lost interest? I think, you know, I've heard people talk about rhino fatigue in, in South Africa. It's a long war. Um, do people tire of thinking, well, perhaps I'm, I'm donating money, but it's not being used in the right way? Uh, I, I think part of this, again, keep talking about it as a war, part of the challenge is, is that um, it's about raising awareness, it's about using communications, not just here in Africa, but, but abroad, to remind people in the rest of the world that this fight is going on. And that there, there are things that, that can be done as well too. I think perhaps too, um, donors uh, in other parts of the world around the world, they maybe have a level of cynicism about where their charity dollar is going. Um, is it being put to the best use? Is it getting to the people and the projects that need it most on the ground? Or is it being swallowed up in say some large bureaucracy and things like that? So I know in my own home country of Australia, people want to know that if they give money to a charity, it is going to a specific project. And, and the sort of projects I like to support are, are grassroots in situ projects where you can see your charity dollar being spent. So I think donors are becoming more savvy and the onus is on NGOs to put their case stronger. Now, another issue that you touch on or deal with in the, in the book is malaria, mm. uh, which is a big problem in Africa. Why are uh, you so concerned about it? Well, I think the numbers are concerning. Rightly, at the moment, you know, as we speak, there's a lot of concern about Ebola, and, and that is definitely something that has to be taken very seriously. Um, but malaria does not kill people in the hundreds or the thousands, it kills people in the millions. And I think if you look at perhaps donor fatigue, I mean, I think probably 
uh, around the world, people would be surprised to know that there are millions of people still dying every year from malaria, a, a preventable disease. And it's great to see people, uh, uh, you know, like Bill Gates and, and South Africa's own Kingsley Holgate looking at s programs as simple as providing mosquito nets or hopefully working towards vaccinations. I think malaria falls off the news. Mm -hmm. I think maybe it needs to get back into the news again. And I have highlighted in this book because Mozambique, where, as you mentioned, part of the book is set, they have strains of cerebral malaria that, that people will die from, you know, within a day or two. Yeah. It's yeah. quite a scary subject, but perhaps we've heard so much about but it over the years that we've forgotten about it. Yeah. And tell me a little bit more about other animals um, that are also being poached, because we talk about elephants, we talk about rhinos, but there are others. Yeah, I wrote a book a, a couple of years ago, a novel called Red Earth, and, and the idea for that book came from a, an ornithologist, a bird a bird, a professor of birding, of, of, of birds, a um, guy by the name of Andre Butta who works for the Endangered Wildlife Trust. And, and he said, will you write a book about vultures? I didn't know, but I mean, vultures are killed in uh, South Africa and other African countries for use in traditional medicine um, on the basis that the vulture with its incredible eyesight, it's so good that if you sleep with a vulture's head under your pillow, you'll be able to see into next week and see the results for next week's lotto <laughs> or the results for your children's exam. Um, pangolins are killed for their scale. It's one of the most traffic, trafficked animals in the world. Uh, I was talking to a, a, a person at a wildlife fundraiser last night who was telling me that, that plants are trafficked. Cycads are exported out of Africa to overseas markets. Um, uh, the abalone is taken as well too. It, it, it can be fatiguing because you, you think you're starting to get a handle on the problem of, of wildlife crime and you realise that it is, it's far more widespread than I think most people know about. I think a lot of it still comes back to that issue of, uh, you know, we have to fight the war on the ground with, with boots on the ground, guns and bullets in some cases, but I think we need to concentrate more on reducing demand for these products around the world. And, and, and I don't believe it's hopeless, but I do believe it'll take a lot of money and a lot of well-resourced communications campaigns, public relations, advertising campaigns. Um, so as with any modern war, we have to concentrate as much on the fight to change behaviour as we do on catching poachers on the ground. Tony Park, thank you so much for coming in and chatting to us about your uh, work in conservation and your book, Captive. It is certainly a book worth reading. And that was it for this edition of Talking Books. Thanks for watching. Until next time. <laughs>